Hi everyone, today we have another exciting Physics 144 lecture. Today we are going into the exciting world of the second and third dimensions. So today we would like to discuss uh, the concept that we talked about last time, but talk about how that generalizes into the two-dimensional and three-dimensional worlds around us. That's important because we are three or three plus dimensional creatures. And so to describe the world, we really need the mechanics to talk about what the third dimension looks like. Fortunately, a lot of the math looks a lot like one dimensions. So the way we define our kinematics in two and three dimensions is to define it as the vector sum of the kinematics in the individual directions. So if we have an x, y, or an x, y, z component system, we consider the motion of a particle in terms of those co coordinates independently, the i, the j, and the k directions define an orthogonal set of coordinates, and the motion of the particle is moving around as a function of time in the x direction, independent from the y, and independent from the z direction. So if we do that, then we have a vector here, which we'll call r, which is the location of the particle, the position of a particle, and it's of some function of x, y, and z in up to these three dimensions. Then we can sort of think about the particle at two different points along this green trajectory curve. And so the position initially would be the vector from the origin of our coordinate system out to where the particle is at initially, then where it goes uh, and the final position on the trajectory. And then a displacement vector is just the final minus the initial in a vector sense. So that gives us this difference here, or maybe it's easier to see, it's the vector that you add to the initial uh, position to get to the final position. So following a one-dimensional case, we consider uh, the average velocity here to just be the change in displacement over some finite interval of time, and then we consider what happens uh, independently in each of the coordinates. And so the average velocity vector is just the component-wise sum of the velocity vectors in the x, the y, and the z direction. So basically the uh, directions in a, or the velocities in a Cartesian coordinate system, which is the orthogonal x, y, z, coordinate system. Uh, they behave independently and we can just create, treat each dimension uh, as separate from the others. Um, then we can consider the limit as the time interval goes to zero. And so we consider what happens when uh, we sort of shrink that down and calculate the instantaneous velocity. And kind of graphically what that happens is it looks like our final position gets closer and closer and closer to our initial uh, position, and we come up with a velocity vector in the limit that is tangent to the particle trajectory. So that means it's pointing along the trajectory at any given time. So tangent here, up here, the tangent would go off in the direction uh, here. Uh, and so that means that the velocity vector is just the component-wise time derivatives of the x, y, and z uh, components, uh, and they just, again, operate independently. So a 3D problem is just three one-dimensional problems. Now we combine everything we learned about vectors with everything we learned about kinematics, and we smoosh those two together, and that gives us a way to define speed. So speed for a particle in three dimensions is just the magnitude of the velocity vector. Uh, so we can consider that a bunch of different ways. Uh, we can consider as the square root of the velocity vector dotted with itself here, uh, or uh, that turns out to be just the Cartesian sum, vx squared plus vy squared plus v squared uh, square root. So sort of like the Pythagorean theorem, but in three dimensions. Uh, so that just gives us uh, an expression here for speed. 
We'll sometimes also consider what happens when we have a particle moving along the curve, and we'll describe that curve as some trajectory s of t. And if we want to find out the motion of the particle moving along the trajectory, kind of independent of the coordinate system, we can kind of view this as a tiny little sum of steps along a curve. So differentially, this little ds is the Carti uh, or sorry, the Pythagorean theorem style sum of the little steps in the x, the y, and the z. And that's what I'm trying to show here, where a step ds from this current position is just a little step dx and a little step dy. And if we do the Pythagorean thumb, we can kind of uh, sum, we can kind of step in that direction. And that means that one way of thinking about the velocity or the speed is going to be the displacement along the trajectory divided by this little time interval, which is just the square root of vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared, kind of like what we set up here. Uh, but this does give us a kind of indication that the velocity is stepping along the trajectory. So it's in, moving the particle along the trajectory, and then we can figure out its total components in any coordinate system just by doing this uh, dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. Okay, uh, one more introductory piece, and that is the acceleration. The acceleration, much like uh, the uh, velocity, is just an extension to component-wise uh, treatment of the uh, derivatives along each direction. So we consider the limit is the velocity vector goes to zero, and that's just uh, dv dt. So I've sort of shown the initial and the final velocities of the particle along this trajectory here. Notice that they are tangent to the curve at every uh, point uh, here. And then if I consider, sort of bring them close together and ask what the difference between the final and the initial velocity is, we get the average acceleration vector. And as these two vectors come together uh, and get closer and closer together, that gives us the instantaneous uh, the, uh, acceleration. And so that gives you a relationship just like velocity, where the acceleration vector is just the x, the y, and the z components multiplied by their corresponding unit vectors, or the magnitude of the acceleration is just the square, you know, the square root of the sum of the squares of the individual components. So uh, giving you a little graphical representation of it, I could ask this question like uh, draw the velocity vectors from T2 to T3 uh, to T4 to T5. Uh, oh, yeah here and I can uh, go in here and the way the velocity vectors are is I just take the initial uh, I basically find the vector that connects the initial to the final uh, position so the velocity vectors are going to look like this this will be v3 uh, this will be v4 and then this will be uh, oh I got to do two to three that's the other one v2 and so that's going to give me my uh, three velocity vectors, v2, v3, uh, v4. And then what I really want to do is find the acceleration vector between v3 and v4. So the average acceleration uh, between these two particles is going to, or is going to be v, uh, oops, v4 minus v3. And so v4 is uh, this vector right here. And so we'll kind of draw that as an arrow. That's the v4. Uh, v3 is this vector right here. And so it would go off kind of in this direction. And that would be v3, but I want negative v3. So it's v4 minus v3. So I actually just switch the direction of it. And so this is v4. This is negative v3. And so the acceleration vector then goes from the tail of one to the tip of the next, and that is the average acceleration vector, which looks a lot like uh, you know, this diagram. And so this is an interesting case. We'll come back to it in gory detail in, I don't know, 20 slides or so. Uh, and this discusses the case of uniform uh, circular motion. That's the particle on the uh, merry-go-round going around, kind of viewed from the top. 
And this is a type of what we call circular motion. And as a particle is moving around on a circle, uh, the acceleration vector here is pointing to the center of the circle. And the other thing that's important to note is that even though it's moving at sort of a constant speed and the intervals are always the same going around, there is nonetheless an acceleration because the direction of the velocity vector has changed, not just the magnitude of the velocity vector. So there is an acceleration even if the speed, that's the magnitude of the velocity vector, does not change. Okay. Um, so I'd like to uh, move now to an example. Uh, this is just uh, starting out uh, to say, uh, well, if I have a particle here with a uh, position that's given by this formula, it's a t squared in the i hat direction plus b t minus c t squared in the j hat direction, I'd like to know what the particle's velocity, speed, and acceleration are. And so if I have this kind of problem, I need to calculate uh, the velocity is the velocity vector is the time derivative of this. And this is just screaming for just doing a little calculus because I have an explicit functional form for what the trajectory is as a function of time. Uh, I have individual x and y components. And so I can calculate that as dr, oh, we'll call that dx by dt i hat plus dy by dt j hat. And so sticking that in the expressions, d, that's d by dt. So we take the time derivative of a t squared times the i hat vector, and we take the time derivative of the uh, b t minus c t squared j hat. Uh, that's the y component of the vector. So now we take the derivative. This is a constant multiplied by t squared in the first term uh, right here. And so I am going to write that. Uh, that's the t squared. The 2 comes down, leaving a 1 in the exponent. And then the 2 gets multiplied up front. So this becomes 2 a t i hat. OK, that's all good. And then I take the time derivative of, of the second term over here. Uh, the time derivative of b times t, b is a constant, so t is t to the first, so that becomes down, comes t to the zero, or the t disappears, and the power comes down as one, so that just becomes a b. And then I do the derivative over here to get minus two c t j hat. So that's the velocity vector. Check. All good. Now I need to know the speed. The speed is the magnitude of the velocity vector, or the square root of v dot v, or vx squared plus vy squared. That's a little messy. Let's make that plus vy squared. Uh, there'd be a vz term if I gave you a third dimension. And so I can just plug that in. This is vx. And this other term is vy. And so the uh, this becomes 4 a squared t squared. I took the 2at and I squared everything. And then I have b minus 2ct quantity squared all to the square root. So I could go ahead and simplify this a little bit, but I'm going to leave it the way it is uh, for right now uh, for reasons that will become clear soon. Okay, the next thing I need to do is to calculate the acceleration. So the acceleration is dv by dt, and I've got an expression for v right here. So I take the time derivative of the individual terms here. So we'll start out with the 2at term. That is just t to the first power. The other two things are constants. So the acceleration there is just going to be 2a i hat. And then the second uh, uh, term, the uh, first part of it, I'm going to take the time derivative of a constant b. That's nothing. It's constant. d by dt of a constant is zero, so it drops out. And then this just uh, takes away the uh, power of t. t to the first becomes t to the zero, leaving me with a minus 2c j hat. So that's the acceleration for the particle. So we're doing well. We got everything that we uh, need here. Uh, okay. So that uh, that would be how I'd calculate these things, but wait, 
there's more. And so I actually want to go ahead and lasso some of my math here. Whoop! Because I'm going to need that for later. Copy. Because if I flip to the next page, I have at what time is the velocity perpendicular to the acceleration? And at what time is the particle's uh, speed instantaneously not changing? So I'm going to pop my math back in here. Because I need it for later. Nope, got a little extra math in here. Let's get rid of that. Goodbye. And so this was my velocity vector. This was my speed. Uh, so velocity vector, speed, and acceleration. So if I'm going to answer a question, at what time is the particle's velocity perpendicular to its acceleration? Well, that's basically asking for when the angle between those two is 90 degrees. We don't have an automatic way of doing that, except we did learn about the dot product last time. And we learned that if two vectors are perpendicular, their dot product is zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set A dotted with V equal to zero. And so then I get, I'm going to carry out the dot product of, of this vector with this vector, which means just multiply together the two x components. So that's going to be, well, I'll write it out. Let's do 2at i hat plus b minus 2ct j hat. That's, oh, that's the velocity vector. So this is v. And fortunately, the dot product commutes. So 2a i hat minus 2c j hat. And then let me uh, maybe a little clearer and change color to say this part up here is the velocity vector. This part down here is the acceleration vector. And so I carry out the dot product by multiplying together the two uh, terms. So this is 2a times 2at. Uh, so that gives us 4a squared t. Uh, and i dot i goes to 1. And then I add the product of uh, vy times ay, which is b minus 2ct times minus 2c. And so I get 4a squared t uh, I'm going to bring up the second term here, which is negative 2c minus 2c, which is plus 4c squared t. And then I have a minus 2cb. And I want to know where those are 0. And so I'm going to solve this for t. And so then t is going to be 2cb over 4a squared plus 4c squared. There's a 2 in every term. So I'm going to just write this as 2cb over 2 a squared plus 2c squared. Okay, so that finds me a time when the velocity is perpendicular to its acceleration. That's pretty cool. Okay. Okay, our next step here is to calculate what the uh, times when the particle's speed is instantaneously not changing. And so that means that we need to find a case where the speed of the particle is not getting larger or smaller. And since the we represent changes uh, in time in uh, physics and calculus by asking, where is that? Uh, quantities time derivative equal to zero. So if I ever see an instantaneously not zero, not changing, that means that the time derivative of whatever quantity that is, is zero at that given point. So I need to actually calculate where, oh, this is going to be tricky, dv by dt is. And we have an expression for the speed, which is right there. So I need to actually take the time derivative of this. And this is something that's a little tricky um, because it involves that chain rule that I was talking about. It's a whole bunch of stuff raised to the one half power. And so the way we take that uh, time derivative is we first take the time derivative of something to the one half power. Let's uh, 
say, and when I do that, I have the one half power and that power comes down. So I get one half, then I get whatever it is raised to the one half minus one or negative one half power. So then I just write down four a t squared plus b minus two c t squared to the minus one half and then I have to take the time derivative of whatever is inside it. And so then that gives me something I'm, oh, I'm totally comfortable with these polynomials. Uh, so for a t squared, the time derivative of that is 8a squared t. And then the time derivative of the second term, oh, it's a mess. It's one of those things where it's something squared. So I got a chain rule again. So I take the time derivative of the mess. Uh, which brings down the two. I write out whatever is left to the one power. So that's to the first power because the two came down leaving behind one. And then I take the time derivative of whatever is inside. The b, that term there, goes away. Time derivative of a constant is zero. Uh, and then we take the time derivative of b uh, minus 2ct, uh, which just leaves us behind a minus 2c. Okay, so that's how we take the time derivative of a big compound expression uh, raised to the one-half power. I want to find out where this is equal to zero. I'm going to institute a handy little border between my mathematics here. There we are. Okay, and uh, the way we're going to do that is by looking at and basically say this is one-half times a bunch of junk that's the square root of something in the denominator. Uh, and then there's a numerator, which is this term. And I'm going to invoke some mathematics, which is the only way that a fraction is going to be zero is if its numerator is zero. Uh, and so all I actually care about is I don't have to worry about this term or this term. I'm going to cross multiply them up feed them into the zero, nom, 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 and it's going to give me uh, a resulting expression that is just a a squared t plus, I'm going to do some multiplying out, I'm going to bring in this uh, two, negative 2c here, I'm going to multiply it by the 2 and the b, and that's going to give me, oops, uh, minus 4b uh, c, and then I have another term here, which is the 2 times negative 2ct times another negative 2c. And so that leaves me with plus 8a, uh, sorry, not a, I'm looking at the wrong part of the formula, um, c squared, t squared. And those negatives went away because I multiplied by two negatives. And that whole mess is equal to zero. So again, I can solve that and I find, uh, oops, this should also be a t squared. No, it should be a t. This is a t here. It's gone. Okay, uh, so that's all good. And so now I can solve for the t. I'm gonna 8a squared plus 8c squared times t. I'll push the minus 4bc to the other side. Uh, then I'll divide, and so I'll get 4bc over 8a squared plus 8c squared. c squared uh, times t. And I have a 4 in all the terms, so I'm left with bc plus 2a squared plus 2c squared. Wait. I've seen this map before. It's right here. These are the same terms. These are the same thing. Ooh, it's kind of cool. And that is generically true. Basically what's happening here is I have a particle. It's moving along a trajectory, has some velocity, call that the velocity vector, and it has some acceleration. And if those are perpendicular to each other, the acceleration is going to curve the uh, velocity vector, change its direction, but it's not gonna change its magnitude. But if, my, if I'm later on in my trajectory and I have a 
particle moving along here and it's up here and I have a velocity vector that's again always tangent to my trajectory and my acceleration vector is doing something else it is not perpendicular to the velocity so this would be perpendicular in my bad drawing. Uh, you have a component that's doing the change of direction. That's the perpendicular component. And you also have a component that goes ahead and is making the magnitude of the velocity vector get larger or smaller. So there is some component going in here that changes direction. So this is changing direction. And then this other component here is going to change speed. And so the acceleration vector can do both, but its orientation relative to the velocity vector actually tells you whether it's increasing or decreasing speed or changing the direction of the particle or both. Okay. All right. Um, I think we're going to do one final example on this time. Kind of uh, which is to kind of go the opposite. Remember with kinematics, we could go from positions all the way to accelerations by taking derivatives. We can also go from uh, accelerations back to positions by taking integrals. So let's go ahead and illustrate that. Uh, this is a case where we have a particle originally at rest and it's located at some position, 3i three, three hat plus 2j hat plus 5k hat in uh, the meters. It's subject to an acceleration that's given by this functional form. And I want to know where I have some constants here. I want to know the particle's position at t equals two seconds. So uh, to the integral forms look just like the one dimensional cases, except we put vectors on top of them. And so one of the expressions that I have is I'm going to start with an acceleration vector here. And then the velocity uh, that I am traveling at is going to be my initial velocity uh, plus the integral from zero to t of the acceleration vector as a function of time times dt. So what this means is that I can actually just carry out an integral, which is the way of just reversing derivatives. And I carry out that integral and I can get to the velocity vector. Uh, I have gone ahead and invoked that our time is starting at t equals zero. If it doesn't, then the zero here and the velocity need to refer to the same time. Right now it's just t equals zero. Then I'm also going to get a big benefit because it's originally at rest. So that means at t equals zero, v equals zero. That seems so important. I'm going to write it down. t equals zero, v naught equals zero. So that means I don't have to worry about that. I love it. It's fantastic. Not worrying is the thing I do best. Okay. So then we carry out the integral. So this is the integral from zero to t of, now I'm going to stick in my actual expression, a t i hat plus b t squared k hat. And I'm going to integrate that uh, with respect to dt. And this just means carry out that integral on the two separate parts. So it's 0 to t of a times t dt. And this will be in the i hat direction i hat's a constant and one of the things you could do with integrals is you can pull constants out front of them i could pull the a out as well uh, plus uh, k hat times i'll do that with the b here because i'm feeling wild zero to t t squared dt and i carry out these two integrals uh, so this is uh, t to the first integrals add powers uh, so this becomes uh, a t squared over 2, uh, and I have to evaluate that at 0 to t uh, times i hat, plus similar thing over here. So this becomes b t cubed over 3 k hat, and that's integrated from 0 to t. So this becomes a t squared over 2 minus 0 i hat plus b t cubed over 3 uh, minus 0 k hat. And so that means I know what my velocity vector is. My velocity vector is going to be a 
t squared over 2 i hat plus b t cubed over 3 k hat. You could probably have stopped here and sort of seen what the results are, and that's just something you're getting away with because the integral is starting at 0 and there's no constant terms or anything. So to get to the position, oops, we are still here. The position is the initial position, which is specified, it's not zero this time, plus the integral from zero to t of velocity vector of v dt. And it's a very similar process. We just cal calculate this on a component by component basis. I'm not going to stick in the velocity vector yet. I'm going by, or sorry, the initial position vector yet, but I'll do the integral of 0 to t of a t squared over 2 i hat plus b t cubed over 3 uh, j hat. And that'll be all integrated with respect to dt. That means carry out the individual parts separately. Uh, so then that's plus, uh, let's see here, this is i hat integral 0 to t of a t squared over 2 dt plus j hat integral 0 to t times bt cubed over 3 dt. And so from there, what I'll do is I'll just carry out those integrals, and I will get uh, that this is r naught plus, um, that's uh, skipping a little bit of the math here, this will be a t cubed uh, we pull a 3, uh, um, it puts a 3 in the denominator, which multiplies by the 2, that gives me a 6 uh, i hat, plus um, the bt cubed term is going to become a t to the fourth, stick a 4 in the denominator, and so that's become bt to the fourth over 4 times 3 is a 12 j hat. Okay, and then I plug in my numbers. And so r naught is equal to 3i hat plus 2j hat plus 5k hat. I just got that out of the problem up here. Uh, and then my uh, expression, I'm going to stick in for t equals 2. Uh, so plus a, I can go and figure out what a is. That's 6 meters per second cube. Oh, sorry, this whole position is times meters. Let me uh, squeeze that in there so I keep my terms to have the same dimension. Meters plus 6 meters per second cubed times time cubed, which is 2 seconds cubed, quantity cubed, all over 6. Well, that's going to give me some nice cancellation. I love it when a term comes together. Uh, oops, I have switched to k hats, uh, from j hats to k hats. Sorry. Uh, let me amend this. This is, that's a k hat. Oh, that's a k hat. And oh, that's a k hat. Get out of here, y direction. You don't belong. And the reason I care about that is that I actually have to be careful when I'm actually adding these together. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, b t to the fourth over 12. So b is a half meters per second to the fourth times t to the fourth, which is two to the two uh, seconds to the fourth power all divided by 12, uh, and that's k hat. Okay, and so uh, when we do that, we get that this is going to be um, six times six times, uh, six divided by six times two cubed. Uh, that's going to all go to eight meters. Uh, two seconds to the fourth is 16, divided by two is eight. Uh, divide by 12, that becomes two-thirds of a meter k hat, and this is uh, i hat, uh, and then I add that to my initial position, and I end up with three i hat plus another eight meters in the i hat direction, that becomes 11 i hat. Nothing in j, and that's why I freaked out when I had stuck in a bunch of j's uh, in the, the vectors, is that we actually have our acceleration here is only in the k direction, and so I actually care about only the k's. Uh, the j remains unchanged. Uh, there's no velocity, no acceleration, so that becomes 2j, 
and then I get my k term, which is the initial term, which is 5, plus the 2 thirds, which I carried out from all of the integrating here. And so that becomes, uh, let's see here, 15 thirds plus 2 thirds is going to be a whopping 17 thirds k hat. And this is all in terms of meters. Okay, so we've got ourselves our um, expression for where the particle is at t equals 2 seconds just by integrating things out. Okay, that's kind of the basics. If you have a particle, a trajectory is a function of time, doing some calculus and the properties of the vector uh, relationships, we can now change uh, boats and consider change change approaches and consider a, a couple different um, special cases of two and three dimensional motion. The first of these is projectile motion. So projectile motion is a special case of two dimensional motion where we have one acceleration vector and that is the gravity. And so it's a great introduction here. And so if I have a Y coordinate and an X coordinate system, my acceleration vector in uh, projectile motion is always going to be pointed in the negative Y direction. It's down, whatever down happens to be. With a magnitude of G, we on Earth, uh, we adopt the standard gravity of 9.81 meters per second squared. So uh, we usually adopt a coordinate system where up is in the plus y direction. You don't have to do this. Uh, and so we actually have to pay, pay attention. But in on average, we usually pick it to be uh, uh, going upward. So gravity points down or in the negative direction. And then x is perpendicular uh, to it. So we end up with our acceleration vector looking a little uh, something like that. So. Uh, given we have our uh, acceleration vector uh, pointing down in the j hat direction, we can then use our one dimensional kinematic relationship. Uh, there's no acceleration in the x direction. And so we write down our one dimensional kinematic relationships that say the velocities in the x direction are unchanged. The velocity in the y direction is only decreased by the action of gravity. There's no other things. I can write down my, there's no acceleration term in the x direction. So my x position is given just by uh, the straightforward, you know, distance equals rate times time uh, equation. Then we get our standard one dimensional kinematic relationship for the y direction. We also have one more kinematic relation in the y direction uh, that we can use, eliminating time from uh, these two equations we can get to here. We covered that in the last video. Uh, note that this is a complicated system of multiple equations. Uh, the thing that you actually want to pay attention to is that the time uh, is the same in both of these. And that's what connects these kind of two dimensions. And indeed, that's true of all two and three dimensional motion. The time is what's actually linking together all of the dimensions uh, mathematically. Okay. Uh, we often describe the particle in terms of its launch angle, which is the velocity vector measured in terms of uh, how it is inclined with respect to the horizontal. So we define this angle here. Uh, your book calls it alpha naught. I'll sometimes slip into theta-ing it or something like that. It's just a name. Uh, and the velocity vector then is given in terms of the i and the j components is uh, doing the trig decomposition of this velocity vector is v cos alpha i hat plus v sine alpha j hat. Okay, so let's do a couple quick notes about uh, projectile motion here. Uh, I have a little... Uh, demo uh, that is coming from the physics education tutorials uh, here in uh, the University of Colorado. The uh, link to that is given right here. Um, and so you can uh, look up the uh, FET physics education tutorials. And we have a little uh, projectile motion demo here. Uh, we have some a little cannon. That cannon can uh, tilt back and forth. Uh, I can uh, change the speed of the cannon, and I can, uh, let's, you know, reduce it a little bit, set up all of these things, and I can then shoot things. 
and it splats down here. I have this turned to slow motion. I can do it as fast motion. Boom! That's the actual time it takes uh, to do this. And this particular diagram is illustrating what happens to the vectors of motion. Uh, I'll start out by showing the velocity vector. And that's kind of makes sense in terms of our two-dimensional motion. Let's see that in slow-mo. The velocity vector is always tangent to this trajectory curve, which is something I've said before. Makes sense. Okay. The acceleration vector is one. It points down in projectile motions. So it's constant and always changing. And the neat thing about that is I can actually look at the velocity vectors in terms of the components. And I'll look at those and you'll see that the X component never changes, but the Y component of velocity is starts out positive and gets smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually turns around at the peak of the trajectory and it goes, excuse me, downward. And that is aligned with the acceleration vector. It's kind of what we would expect. The velocity vector is always being pulled in the direction of the acceleration vector. Uh, the final thing that's worth noting is that this part of it, this trajectory is independent of mass. I can fire all kinds of different objects here, Boop. hit them right onto the um, platform. I can uh, look at a cannonball with a different mass, does the same thing. I'm going to do a, oh, I did a human. I can do a piano. Uh, all of these things end up with the exact same projectile motion as long as there's nothing like air resistance. If you turn on air resistance, things start to behave a little bit uh, differently. So what I'd like to do is to sort of go through some of the examples of the um, uh, projectile motion problems to just sort of show how these systems of equations uh, work together. So, uh, oh, sorry, these are a few points here. We said all of these, uh, the trajectory is independent of mass. The acceleration always points downward. The X component of the velocity never changes. The Y component gets pulled down by acceleration and basically adds in the negative Y direction. And then the velocity vector is always tangent to the trajectory. True of motion in general. Uh, let's start out by asking, what's the uh, velocity vector here? Well, this is a particle that's being moved along this little curve, uh, and then it sort of, uh, follows parabolic motion. This is like a stop time photograph where each of these uh, uh, pictures of the ball is taken at a instant that is separated from the previous instant by a fixed time interval. So the time between each of the dots is the same. And so it lands down here, down 1.4 meters, and over 2.0 meters from where it launches. Whenever you're doing projectile motion problems, first thing I always like to do is set up an origin to my coordinate system. I'm going to pick right here at the bottom uh, for the coordinate system. I'm going to pick a sane one, which is that the x direction goes horizontally, the y direction goes uh, vertically, and then I can just write down the kinematic equations uh, that I know. I know that the velocity here is designed to be launched flat. So the velocity vector is some x component of the velocity in the i hat. It has no vertical uh, components, so there is no j component to it. Uh, the velocity over that's initial, uh, that's the initial velocity. Uh, the velocity over time. Uh, in the x direction is just going to be that same speed v0x the velocity in the y component in the y direction is uh, starting out with zero because it's not going up or down but because it's projectile motion its speed is going down at minus gt not going to be super helpful uh, what i do know is that the positions there so my position uh, is going to be my Initial position, which I have chosen here to be zero in the x direction, uh, plus v0x times t. Uh, so just for clarity, 
that's defined to be zero. In general, I leave everything as variables except for zeros, which I drop the terms out of the equation. Okay, returning uh, here, and we do y is equal to y naught uh, plus b zero y t. Uh, that's another thing that has gone to zero, and then uh, minus one half g t squared. Uh, y naught is uh, given in the problem. That's the 1.4 meters. That's the initial vertical displacement. And then the final is where it lands on the ground. Uh, and by choice, that's zero. Okay, I have a system of equations I can solve at this point. Uh, so I'll start out by asking what I'm after, which is the V naught X here. Uh, that's the thing I want. The thing I don't know in this equation is t, so I'm going to use the other equation over here to solve for t. Uh, so writing out what we actually have, so that 0 is equal to y naught minus, oh, I'm in the wrong color. So 0 is equal to y naught minus 1 half g t squared. That middle term has dropped out. I solve it. I'll push the half g t squared to the other side. So y naught is equal to 1 half gt squared, solve for t, so t is 2y naught over g uh, raised to the 1 half power. Then I will stick that back in to this other equation here and uh, solve for uh, v naught x. So v naught x is equal to x over t is equal to x over the square or times the square root of g over 2y naught. I've inverted my original expression to get to this one. And then I can actually just plug in numbers. So x is the 1.4, uh, x is 2.0 meters, 2.0 meters, times the square root of 9.81 meters per second squared over 2 times y naught, which is 1.4 meters. And that whole thing will uh, grind itself away to become 3.7 meters per second. So the velocity vector initial is 3.7 meters per second in the i hat direction. And we're where we want to be. Okay. Basics of projectile motion. Just to recap what happened here, uh, started out by setting up a coordinate system and choosing some directions. We wrote down the relevant projectile motion formulas, um, uh, and then we use them as a system to solve and find the variable that we want. Okay. Uh, if I, I can do similar uh, process here, ask if I set uh, over here my um, projectile, uh, I'm going to, let's see here, uh, let's uh, clear all of this in my lab. I'm going to go down to zero. I'm going to set my angle to 40 degrees, and I'm going to crank my speed to 30 meters per second, and I'm going to fire this. And my piano leaves the stadium. But the question that I'd like to answer is, how long did the projectile, the piano in this case, stay airborne? Well, again, we have a, uh, we do the same process as before. Uh, we set up a coordinate system with a piano's trajectory, trajectory in it. Uh, X and Y coordinates, I'm going to pick my origin to be where I launched from. I have an angle here, which is the 40 degrees. And then I, uh, I'm going to go ahead and solve this again uh, using a uh, the position uh, formulas. The only one I really need to worry about is the y formula. So y is equal to y naught plus v naught sine alpha naught times t minus one half g t squared. And the only reason I have to worry about that is I only care about time. And in this equation, I know everything but time. I know that the final and the initial uh, altitudes or the heights are zero. And so therefore, I also know what V naught, sine alpha, and G are. So I can go ahead and solve that. So this becomes, there we are. Uh, so we know that zero is equal to V naught, sine alpha naught, T minus one half G, T squared 
is equal to t times v naught sine alpha naught minus one half g t. And so this is a product of two numbers that's zero. Therefore, uh, one or both of them has to be zero. So there's two solutions, either t equals zero or t uh, is equal to, or, or sorry, uh, let's just do this as one half minus one half gt is minus v naught sine alpha naught. It's not the cleverest algebra, but that's okay. Uh, so we get two v naught sine alpha naught over g. So the t equals zero, this initial one up here, that's where it launches from. So that's this point. And then the v naught sine alpha over g is uh, where it lands over here. Uh, then I can plug in my numbers, which was uh, the hopes. So we get two times 30 meters per second uh, times sine alpha, sine of 40 degrees, all over 9.81 meters per second squared. Uh, I work all that out and I get 3.93 seconds. And I head on back over here and uh, zoom out. And I have my little time and range finder here and put it where the piano is splatted. And sure enough, I get 3.93 seconds for the amount of time it took for that piano to go over the top. All right, the last thing I'd like to do in projectile motion is to try to answer a question like that. So this refers to uh, this lab setup. I'd like to know how to hit this target here at 15 meters. If I have a cannon that is set up at five meters and an angle of 60, I'd like to know what I'm gonna set my initial speed here so that I actually hit the target. And that's not it. So let's uh, go and do a little physics here. Um, so switching back. Uh, I'm going to set up uh, a little, uh, my, my setup is that I have a uh, projectile motion problem, launches at 60 degrees above the horizontal, comes over here and splats. I know that that's 5 meters, I know that that's 15 meters at some unknown speed, v naught, and then this uh, angle is 60 degrees, and that's everything I need to know. Okay. Uh, I'm going to pick my origin to be there. I'm going to pick my same coordinate systems uh, where up is in the y direction. And then what I'm going to do is uh, write out the uh, expressions I know. So in terms of the uh, horizontal position, I know that we're going to end at 15 meters. We're going to start and then that's v naught cos alpha naught times t. Uh, so that'll give me my expression to figure out how far it's going. By choice of coordinate system, x0 is equal to 0. That's 0. Okay, uh, similar expression for y. So y is equal to y0 plus v0 sine alpha0 t minus 1 half gt squared. Uh, by choice, my y where I finish is going to be zero, and then I have the other things. So we're gonna adopt the strategy where we don't know how long it will take, and we don't know what the speed v naught is. So I'm going to use the first equation here to solve for t and substitute that into the second. And in doing so, I get that this is x over v naught cos alpha naught uh, is equal to t. I'm going to plug that into this equation up here. And so we get that 0 is equal to y naught plus v naught sine alpha naught times t, which is x over v naught cos alpha naught. And then we get minus 1 half g times x over v naught cos alpha naught quantity squared. Okay. And from uh, that expression, we actually have some nice math that works out here in that the v naughts are going to cancel here. And then sine over the cosine is just going to become tangent. And so then we get that this is y naught plus x tangent alpha naught minus one half g x v naught 
cos alpha naught quantity squared. Ooh, all right, so, so far so good. And then what we can do from here is solve for the v naught. And I'll do that by pushing this expression to the other side of the equation, uh, adding it to both sides. And so we will end up with um, 1 half g times x over v naught uh, cos alpha naught squared is equal to y plus x tan alpha naught. And then I'm going to solve for v naught by multiplying both sides by v naught squared and dividing both sides by the y plus x tan alpha naught uh, expression. And if I do that, I get that v naught squared is equal to um, x squared uh, g over 2 cos squared alpha naught uh, time, oops, sorry, uh, two plus, uh, or divided by y plus x tan alpha naught. And so this, uh, let me tidy it up. That's supposed to be a v naught squared. And so the v naught is just of a square root of that. So v naught is equal to the square root of gx squared over 2 cos squared alpha naught y plus x tan alpha naught raised to the one half power and then it's all over but subbing in some values so let's do that all right we get 9.81 meters per second squared because it's g x is how far it travels that's the 15 meters quantity squared we divide that by two times the cosine of 60 degrees cosine 60 it's something i know that's a half so squared is a quarter and then uh, y is the five meters plus the um, uh, let's see here the uh, x is the 15 meters times the tangent of 60 degrees oh I, I actually know the tangent of 60 degrees too it's uh, sine over cos sine is root 3 over 2 cos is a half so it's root 3 so that's root 3 cool Take the square root and plug that into my calculator. Do do do, and that's one one point nine three meters per second. Uh, or if we were cared about significant figures, you would say that's either two or possibly one, depending on how to treat that uh, as a decimal place or period. Uh, so two significant figures would be twelve meters per second, which we can check. Let's try twelve. and it's a hit so physics worked or yeah this physics was the same as the physics that's in the computer here fantastic okay so that kind of sums up all i want to say about um uh it's what i wanted to say about projectile motion uh you've probably seen a lot of those problems before i just want to kind of refresh and remind you of how it works in terms of mechanics uh the next thing to talk about is uniform circular motion uh so uniform circular motion is a fairly common state of motion in physics problems uh, and we sort of saw this alluded to with the merry-go-round problem a little earlier. Uh, and the statement is basically that if a object is traveling at a speed v on a circular path of radius r, there must be an acceleration towards the center of the circle with magnitude v squared over r. I'm not telling you that there's a force or anything like that. I just say that to stay on that trajectory, you need an acceleration pointing towards the center. Uh, you can figure uh, this out by kind of considering this uh, in terms of geometry. This is a little satellite image of a car uh, rotary, um, and here's a little truck uh, going around it now and a little bit later. And these are some velocity vectors uh, that I've sketched in. Now, uh, if we look at the now and the later, and we take later uh, minus now, that acceleration vector points towards the center of the circle and we need to figure out how big it is and you, that v squared of r is reasonable 
it's got it should be related to how big the circle is. Uh, if I'm going around a smaller circle, I need to change my velocity vector more. Uh, if so, I need something that gets bigger as the radius gets smaller. And uh, if velocity vector is bigger, it needs more of a change. So the v squared over r is a reasonable kind of scaling. Uh, we can sort of work it out by thinking about a coordinate system where there is a uh, position uh, vector anchored at the center. The origin here is at the center. Our position vectors go to the truck now and truck later. There's a little bit of an angle in between them here and then a change in the uh, uh, displacement vector or, or the displacement vector is uh, the uh, vector straight down there. Okay. And so if we actually consider the position here and we think about the uh, velocity vectors that we looked at earlier and figure out what the acceleration is, uh, we come to the realization that these two triangles are similar in their relationships. Namely, that the uh, scale, uh, to stay on a circle, uh, the velocity vector uh, relative to its magnitude must ha be proportional to the displacement vector relative oh, sorry the change in velocity relative to the mag the speed must be uh proportional or must be equal to the um change in displacement or the displacement vector relative to the size of, of the circle and so uh since we sort of have a side angle side uh, side angle side uh scaling relationship they can be they are similar and so that allows us to sort of equate uh these two expressions and find that delta v is the speed uh over the radius times the displacement and then if i carry out divide by delta t and take the limit as this goes to zero this delta r over delta t becomes the v squared over r and that's my centripetal acceleration that uh, comes from Latin. It just means center seeking. So it's the acceleration pointing towards the center. I'll note mechanically, we often deal with uh, the period and we'll say that the period of the rotation, I just want to note the vocabulary here, uh, is that circular motion uh, undergoes a period in one revolution around the circle. And so basically the time it takes to do that is the distance over the speed uh, the distance that it has to travel is 2 pi r, uh, the speed is v, and so the period is 2 pi r over v. Now, I'm very careful in first year physics, this is the centripetal acceleration. I don't want to say the words centrifugal force. Centrifugal force only shows up in non-inertial reference frames. More on that in a few slides. Uh, but it is what we call fictitious, which is largely from your choice of reference frame. And it's important, uh, and we'll show up with it, but we need to get into the physics of accelerating reference frames, to which I defer to my esteemed colleagues in, who are going to be teaching Physics 244. Uh, just wait for it. It's fantastic, uh, but... Um, We'll uh, not do that right here. What we will do is non-uniform circular motion. So what happens, uh, v squared over r is the acceleration if the v isn't changing. If the object is speeding up or slowing down, then there's an acceleration in the tangent direction. We saw that with the a dot v calculations we did a little earlier and sort of argued that this must be true. Uh, so. In the case where you have a trajectory going around a circle and that velocity vector is only being changed by the radial acceleration or, or the centripetal acceleration, uh, then you stay on this constant speed circle going around. But if you're speeding up, then there's a tangential component to the acceleration, and then the vector sum of these two vectors is not pointing towards the center of the circle anymore. It's increasing in speed. There's a component that keeps it on the circle, and then there's a component that sort of moves it uh, towards faster speeds. Similarly, uh, if it's decreasing, the velocity vector is pointing backwards with respect to the trajectory. There's a tangential component to the velocity that's slowing it down and a centripetal component that is driving it towards the center of the circle. Uh, so this is the case where the particle will be slowing down in terms of speed. Okay, so this is all good for circles, but not everything moves in a circle. And in fact, 
uh, we have kind of these arbitrary random trajectories that kind of do little loop-de-loops and go all over. And so we need to basically figure out what the accelerations are along these trajectories. And the key for doing that is to set up our very own coordinate system that's basically kind of locally like a circle. Uh, and we call this, uh, we'll call, I'll call this the NT or the normal tangent coordinate system, which is not the XY coordinate system, but it's anchored on the trajectory of the particle. And the N, uh, the T component is tangential and it's a unit vector that points along the trajectory of the particle. And then the N component is normal to it, uh, and that normal is just the fancy math word of saying 90 degrees or perpendicular. Uh, so it is 90 degrees away from the tangential, so it forms an orthogonal or right angle coordinate system. And then it points towards the center of curvature for the curve. And the center of curvature for a curve is kind of tricky. That is basically if we represent the curve with a circle, locally we sort of imagine a circle that has the same curvature as the actual trajectory and uh it, it and matches up and touches the uh, uh trajectory right at this point then we get this little circle and the radius of that circle is called the radius of curvature now i'm going to swap which is a statement without proof uh, I'm just going to assert this. This is the kind of thing where if you need this formula, we'll make sure that you know it shows up uh, for you. Uh, and we can say that if I know the x and the y of this uh, curve as a function of time, I can write down that uh, radius of curvature in terms of the time derivatives of the trajectory. Or what that practically means is it's the magnitude of the velocity vector cubed over V cross A, where the A is the acceleration uh, vector, and so and that's the magnitude of that. So we don't have to worry about uh, the directions or anything. Uh, this just gives us an expression for the radius. I'll note that a straight object has a um, radius of curvature that goes to infinity. It gets really large because it's not curving. Uh, okay, um, another way we might have another swap or statement without proof is if I tell you the y as a fun function of x, then you can figure out the radius of curvature for a path uh, by 1 plus the derivative squared over the curvature, d derivative dy by dx uh, squared, and these are all kind of, um, these are all non-negative uh, terms here. So we'll do some examples with this particular expression in class. Uh, these are here mostly for completion and the fact that when you see them in second year, you'll be like, I've seen that before, uh, but we'll uh, use this in some of our problems. But this is a way of representing an arbitrary trajectory locally as a circle. And in that case, I write down an acceleration vector here that is a uh, radial component of the acceleration in the n direction and a tangent component of the acceleration in the tangent direction. The tangent unit vector is always in the direction of the velocity. Remember, velocity is tangent to the curve. We use that by taking the velocity vector and dividing by the speed. That gives us a unit vector. And then the radial component, we already know, that's v squared over r, where r is the radius of curvature for a curve. Okay, so this gives us the mechanics that we need to solve problems like this. Uh, I give you a particle undergoing plane curvilinear motion, which just means it's moving on a curve in a two-dimensional plane. Uh, its velocity vector is given to us as 3i hat plus 4j hat meters per second. And the radius of curvature is 6.25 meters per second. So let's uh, sketch that out for a moment. So we have a velocity vector uh, for a particle. And so we have the particle. Its velocity goes over 3 meters per second, up 4 meters per second. And so its velocity, which is tangent to the curve, looks a little like that. So the curve must look something like this so that it's tangent at that point and we know at that point also its radius of curvature is 6.25 meters 
We also know that the particle is slowing down so that there is an acceleration in the tangential direction, pulling it backwards. And then it's on this curve, so there's got to be a centripetal or radial acceleration. Sorry, I overwrote my three. That's a three uh, meters per second. Okay, so that gives us the mechanics. We want to set this up. Uh, we'd like to know what the velocity in the normal tangential coordinates is. The velocity is always in the tangent direction, so this is actually pretty easy. Uh, it is um, v is purely in the tangent direction, and it's the magnitude of the vector in that direction. So it's 3 squared plus 4 squared tangent meters per second, or 5 meters per second in the tangent direction. There is no normal component to the velocity ever. The acceleration is a little harder. The acceleration has a radial component in the normal direction plus a tangential component in the tangent direction. We know that the radial component has a magnitude of v squared over r in the normal direction, and then the tangent is specified in the problem right up here. So v squared over r, that's uh, 25 meters squared per second squared over 6.25 meters in the normal direction, plus um, a component in the uh, tangent direction, it's slowing down, so I can project that and note that it is in the opposite direction of the velocity vector, so it's minus two meters per second in the tangent direction. Uh, this uh, chunk here goes to four meters per second, and so we are left with our final answer of four meters per second in the normal direction minus two meters per second in the tangent direction. Okay, uh, let's try another problem. Uh, this one asks the question of, at a given instant, the jet plane has a speed of 400 meters per second and an acceleration of 30 meters per second acting in the direction shown. There's a 60 degree angle between the velocity and the acceleration. Determine the increase in the plane's speed and the instantaneous radius of curvature of the path. And so we have a total uh, acceleration in the nt coordinate system. So we can set up, uh, this is the n hat direction, and this is the t hat direction. So this becomes the radial component of the acceleration in the normal direction, plus the tangent component in the tangent direction. And here we can use the fact that the velocity vector points in the tangent direction to figure out what these components are, namely that if I project the acceleration into the tangent direction here, looks uh, that kind of projection there, so I'll actually draw it here, and I'll say that this projection uh, in this component, the radial component, must be uh, equal to a times the sine of 60 degrees. And then the tangential component, which goes along the bottom, is going to have a magnitude of a cos 60 degrees. So that gives us the pieces that we need. We know that the tangential component is going uh, forward here. So this is, uh, let's see, radial. Let's do the radial first. A uh, sine of 60 degrees in the n hat plus the tangent, which is a cos 60 degrees in the uh, tangent direction. And so uh, if we actually uh, figure out, we need to know what the increase in the rate plane's rate of speed is. That is the tangential component. At is the rate of increase in the plane's speed. So that is uh, a sub t is equal to 30 meters per second squared times the cosine of 60 degrees. That is a half. So this is equal to 15 meters per second squared. Done. Uh, we can do the same calculation to figure out the radial component. And there we know that the radial component is equal to 30 meters, uh, a 
sine of the angle, but that's also equal to v squared over r. So we can figure out that r is v squared over a sine of theta, which is equal to 400 meters per second quantity squared over the acceleration, which is 30 meters per second squared times the sine of 60 degrees, which is root 3 over 2. And if we uh, grind that all out, we get an answer of 6.16 kilometers. Okay, we're almost there. We have one other thing to talk about, and that is the 2D case of relative motion. So, so far, we have only considered a fixed coordinate system appropriate for describing one object. But if there are multiple objects in a system, we really would like to describe how they move with respect to each other. So we can consider sort of two uh, observers considering an object moving here, in this case, P. And we'd like to understand how observer A and observer B describe the motion of P respectively. And I'm going to set up a weird notation. It's the same notation as in your book. And I'm going to say that in this case, the position of the object P right here as observed by A. So I'll use this P slash A notation to mean object P observed by A or with respect to A is the object P with respect measured with respect to B plus the separation between B and A. So that is object B with respect to A. And geometrically, this makes sense. This is object of P with respect to A is that one. And then that's object P with respect to B plus object A uh, uh, B with respect to A. Sorry, this should say B slash A because we're not savages here. Okay. So, uh, that means that if I take the time derivative of uh, these uh, particles, we will often, uh, we, we just get a uh, fairly simple relationship that if I take the time derivative of, of those three vectors, we get that the velocity of P with respect to A is the velocity of P with respect to B plus the velocity of B with respect to A. And that follows by just passing the time derivative through. And here's the subtle point assuming everybody agrees on what the time is. We will break that assumption in about 10 weeks. Uh, but for now, this gives us an expression that simply says we can figure out what the velocities are uh, with respect to uh, two separate observers describing the same particle p. Okay. Now, uh, what happens for accelerations? Well, accelerations run into a uh, peculiar case, which is um, we can basically, oh, uh, one final note uh, that before I get into accelerations is that we, uh, since the vector B with respect to A is negative A with respect to B, we can do the exact same math and we get that these uh, two velocities, A with respect to B and B with respect to A, are negative. They're opposite, but with the same magnitude of each other, which I think is just something we will bank for later. Uh, we can return to velocities, take a second derivative again, and we get the acceleration of p with respect to a is the, the acceleration of p with respect to b plus the acceleration of b with respect to a. And what we typically want to operate in is the case where v with respect to a b with respect to a is a constant. And then the time derivative of that term is zero. And so these two accelerations are zero. This term here will drop out. In that case, we describe the a and b as operating in inertial reference frames. And that's important because inertial reference frames are the places where Newton's laws work. They don't work outside of inertial reference frames. That's where centrifugal and other fictitious forces are coming from. 
All of these relationships hold perfectly well in higher dimensions. The, all I've done here is I've added the velocity vectors, and if I consider a with respect to b, that's moving the opposite direction of b with respect to a. So these are all basically hold in one dimension and higher dimensions. Okay, so this gets us to a case where we can start to ask questions about, well, what happens if a river is flowing northward at 2 meters per second? So we have a river here, we have an observer on the bank, we have a boat that is traveling north of east relative to the water at an angle of 36.87 degrees, degrees, which is a very special angle. Uh, and so then the river is moving at two meters per second, and then the boat is moving at five meters per second. And we want to know what is the speed of the boat relative to this observer standing on the shore. So this is O on the shore. And then measured relative to north, what is the direction of the boat traveling relative to the observer on the shore? So the secret trick here is that the cosine of 36.87 degrees is four-fifths and the sine of 36.87 degrees is 3 fifths. This is kind of the angle in a 3, 4, 5 right triangle. Okay, uh, so that actually is there to simplify our math a little bit. So we uh, write down the expression uh, that the velocity of the boat with respect to the observer on the shore is equal to the velocity of the boat with respect to the river, plus the velocity of the river with respect to what's on the shore. And then we write out these uh, directions. So the velocity of the boat with respect to the river, that's five meters per second. And then in this coordinate system, if I decompose this into an I, J coordinates, that's not a J, I, J coordinate system, then the, let's see here, the sine direction here is going to give me the x direction. So this is basically times sine theta, or three fifths in the I hat direction, plus five meters per second times four fifths, that's the cos theta in the J direction. And then we add to that the river which is two meters per second in the J direction. And so then this becomes uh, uh, five cancel, three I hat. Um, so that's just three I hat. And then we have uh, fives cancel, leaving me the four plus two plus six J hat meters per second. So this gives me the ability to measure the uh, uh, speed, the velocity vector, uh, I need to figure out what the speed of that particular um, boat is. So that is just uh, the speed, v, b slash o, and that is the square root of 3 squared plus 6 squared, which is 9 plus 36, or root 45 meters per second, or being clean and nice is 3 root 5 meters per second. Cool. Then I want to know what the angle is measure, measured relative to north. I have this velocity vector, so I can figure out uh, the angle here. Uh, the way we have set up the problem is that uh, if we have this, uh, I want to measure east of north. I'm going to call that angle phi. That's the Vx, that's the Vy, and that's my V of the shore. Uh, that angle east of north is going to have a tangent angle, which is going to be Vx over Vy. We would normally write down y over x if we were doing a uh, plus x axis uh, point where we we're considering the zero for our angle. But for this, we uh, write down Vx over uh, the Vy. The Vx is 3. Uh, meters per second. Vy is 6 meters per second. We take, uh, and from there, we find that phi is the arctangent of a half, or 
that's equal to 26.57 degrees east of north. Okay, so that gives us an example of how we would figure out uh, these components of the velocity and use this uh, expression here for our um, the uh, relative motions of the particles. Okay. So the final thing I'd like to cover today is this example, uh, which asks, at the instant shown, jet A is traveling at 100 meters per second around a curve, increasing its speed at 20 meters per second squared. Uh, jet B is traveling at 180 meters per second straight, increasing at 15 meters per second squared. Uh, we want to determine the relative velocity and the relative acceleration of A with respect to B at this instant. So I'm going to write down a velocity formula uh, using the relative velocity. I'm going to say that the velocity of A with respect to the ground is going to be the velocity of A with respect to B plus the velocity of B with respect to the ground. And what we care about is this middle term, velocity of A with respect to B. And so then the velocity of A with respect to B is just going to be the velocity of A with respect to the ground plus the velocity of B with, oh, sorry, minus the velocity of B with respect to the ground. So that's A with respect to B. That's velocity of A with respect to the ground minus velocity of B with respect to the ground. Uh, and then we just write down the information that we know in this problem to calculate uh, these components. So as this is set up, I'm going to set up an xy coordinate system here, which is i hat and j hat. I'm not going to worry about picking an origin because we only care about velocities and accelerations right now. Um, but it could be right there for all we care. So. Uh, to figure out uh, the velocity of A with respect to B, we need to know what A is with respect to the ground. Uh, it's going this way at, uh, what, 100 meters per second? And this angle is 45 degrees. And so the velocity of A with respect to the ground is going to be uh, the 100 meters per second times uh, the, let's see here, that angle is going to be here 45 degrees because everything is 45 degrees so it's going to be in the x direction so it's going to be root 2 over 2 that's the cosine of 45 degrees times the 100 meters per second minus the same term 1 root 2 over 2 times 100 meters per second uh, in the uh, j hat direction i need my i hat there so that's the velocity of a with respect to ground Velocity of B with respect to the ground is just going to be the 180 meters per second. So it's 180 meters per second in the I hat direction. And uh, in that case, we're able to, um, yeah, go ahead and uh, subtract these two. And so that's going to be uh, root two over two times, uh, sorry, it's going to be root two over two times 100 meters per second minus 180 meters per second in the i hat direction uh, minus root 2 over 2 times 100 meters per second in the j hat direction. And so then that is going to be, uh, let's see here, it's going to be uh, 0.7071 times 100 minus 180, and that's uh, minus 109. 109.3 meters per second in the i hat uh, minus uh, 7d.7 meters per second in the j hat. Okay, so this gives us a velocity of a with respect to b. So, sorry, that's the velocity a with respect to b here as well. Okay. Okay, to continue, we want to figure out the relative accelerations of these uh, two. So I'm going to clear my math here and uh, get right to it. So the accelerations, we are going to follow a similar expression that the acceleration of A with respect to B is the acceleration of A with respect to the ground minus the acceleration of B with respect to the ground. That means we have to calculate these things. 
I'm going to start with the acceleration of B with respect to ground because it's straightforward. It's increasing its speed at 15 meters per second in uh, the I hat direction. And so A of uh, the acceleration of B with respect to the ground is just going to be uh, 15 meters per second squared in the I hat direction. The acceleration of A with respect to the ground is tricky because it's on this curved trajectory. It's a circular path uh, going around here. And so we need to calculate the components from its radial and its tangential component. I'm gonna, uh, let's uh, say that this is going to be the radial component in the uh, normal direction plus the tangential component in the tangential direction. But we need this in the i and j coordinates. So the acceleration radially is going to be uh, a rad is going to be v squared over r, and then the and that's going to be 100 meters per second quantity squared over 500 meters, 500 meters, and that's 20 meters per second squared. The tangential is uh, also going to be 20 meters per second squared. So this just gives the magnitude. Now we have to break them down. The acceleration in the radial component is going this way. So that's the radial. The tangential is headed off in the direction of the motion. It's increasing its speed. So it's increasing in that motion. And so if we break these down, uh, all of these angles here are going to be 45 degrees. So this will be 45 degrees and this other angle here will be 45 degrees. And so the radial motion is going to have a negative component in the x direction, and the tangential is going to have a positive component in the x direction. So the uh, acceleration of A with respect to ground in the x direction is going to be the radial component. Uh, it's going to be negative 20 meters per second squared in the radial component and that's going in the times root 2 over 2, that's the cosine of the 45 degrees, I hat, uh, plus 20 meters per second times root 2 over 2. Uh, that's the tangential component, uh, and this whole thing is going to sum together to give a zero. That's great. Uh, in the I hat direction, I should say. Uh, I should go ahead and add the J components. So the J components here are plus... Uh, or in that case, minus, both of them are pointing downward in this case. So this is minus 20 meters per second squared, root two over two in the J hat, minus, that's the radial component, 20 meters per second squared, minus uh, or times root two over two in the J hat component. And so that means that the uh, component of A with respect to the ground is minus 28.2, meters per second squared in the j-hat. And then to figure out a of a with respect to b, that is we add the, we uh, subtract uh, the velocity of a with respect to ground minus 28.2 meters per second squared j-hat minus the acceleration of b with respect to the ground, which we calculated as 15 meters per second squared. So 15 meters per second squared I have. So that gives us the capacity to figure out both the velocities and the accelerations with respect to of A with respect to B. All right, uh, that covers the examples and the uh, theory for what we're going to do. We're going to dive into some more details uh, as we get back to this in class. Uh, but for now, that's the end of the video. Uh, talk to you all later.